When I put together my WCW Cruiserweights video, I mentioned that I wanted to talk a bit more about Disco Inferno, real name Glenn Gilberti, in a wrestling landscape filled with older stars trying to secure wins at the highest level and younger guys struggling to get a break, Disco Inferno went out there with his 70s inspired gimmick and put on some fun matches. Disco wasn't to everyone's liking, a quick look around the internet will show you an incredible divide when it comes to Disco Inferno. Some loved the guy, others couldn't have cared less, but I thought Disco was a great on screen talent and one deserving of his own wrestling bios video. So let's get started looking into the WCW career of Disco Inferno. Now just a heads up, this video won't be the traditional format of looking at match after match. Admittedly, many of Disco Inferno's matches were without consequence whether he won or lost, but I'll be sure to talk about some of his key moments. Glenn Gilberti grew up watching wrestling, becoming a super fan and recording every wrestling show he could on his VCR. Being in the Atlanta area and having cable television meant there was plenty of wrestling shows for Glenn to indulge in, and this is what he done for the majority of his teenage years. The guy was a super fan. Glenn admitted that he was mainly interested in storylines, interviews, and match finishes. He did enjoy watching bigger main event matches, but what really captivated him was promo work. He particularly enjoyed Mid-South wrestling growing up. One week after graduating from college, Glenn immediately tried out for wrestling. He had a friend who was a travel agent and this friend booked travel arrangements for NWA superstars at the time. Out of the blue, Disco's travel agent buddy told him that he could arrange a tryout. Thanks to Glenn playing a various amount of sports in school, he was in relatively good shape and he thought that he could give wrestling a shot. Glenn passed his tryout and he went on to get further training at Bill Eddy's school, however it was Steve Lawler who done most of his training. Glenn says he got lucky, he was hitting the ropes and taking bumps just fine during the earliest days of his training and Lawler felt he was ready to have his first professional match in late 1991. Glenn jokes that he got an envelope after his first match. The envelope would normally contain a wrestler's payment for working that evening. He opened it up and found it empty. So he did get an envelope, however it just didn't have any money inside. Glenn began working the indies and thankfully he began getting paid $20 to $40 per match and he used this time to improve his ring work. He would pick Bill Eddy's brain while travelling from show to show, learning pro wrestling psychology and hearing stories from a true ring veteran. You know who else Disco Inferno had to drive with during his early days? Jake Roberts and the Iron Sheik, so you can imagine this green guy in the business taking these veterans from town to town, making pit stops at the local dealers. Glenn said that his drives with Jake and Sheik were wild, but he still tried to gain knowledge from riding with these veterans, at least when they were not wasted. But anyway, Glenn's earliest gimmicks included the Slave, the Brooklyn Stud, and he wrestled in a tag team known as the Bod Squad. Raven has been credited as the man who came up with the Disco Inferno character. Glenn and Raven became friends on the independent scene and during a brainstorming session, Raven thought that the Disco Inferno character would be a great fit for Glenn. Glenn didn't use the gimmick straight away, but when Raven got Glenn booked in the USWA in Memphis, they wanted the Disco Inferno character that Raven had pitched to them. July 10th, 1993, Johnny Polo introduces Disco Inferno in the USWA, a man who is angry that there are no discos in Memphis due to the place being overrun with honky tonk bars and the like. This is definitely Disco Inferno version 0.1 here, there was a lot of work needing to be done, but at least he was getting a little bit more exposure. Glenn got quite disheartened when the USWA only used him for a few weeks and he felt the Disco Inferno gimmick was to blame. He went back to using his real name after his USWA stint came to an end, working here for All Star Wrestling in Georgia while feeling a little down and out over his time in Memphis. 
It was riding with Jake Roberts though that turned things around. Jake had seen the Disco Inferno character and he felt there was more to it. Jake was the one who helped Glenn with character nuances and general help in believing more in the gimmick. So this also begs the question, did Glenn Gilberti really enjoy disco music? Well, yes he did. Glenn said in an interview he was a fan of old rock and roll music but he also enjoyed house music. Through house music he discovered old disco tunes and he became a fan of the genre. There seems to be this narrative that Glenn hated the disco gimmick but in everything I've watched and read he seemed to actually enjoy the character, well initially at least. The Disco Inferno character also, obviously, drew a lot of comparisons to John Travolta in Saturday Night Fever. Glenn said yes, absolutely, the Disco Inferno character drew a ton of inspiration from John Travolta and the 70s disco movie. I mean, you'd have to be blind to not see the resemblance. Terry Taylor and Ole Anderson were helping to run shows in Mississippi that Glenn was booked in, and Glenn worked here as the Disco Inferno. Terry Taylor noticed that the character was getting good heat from the audience, and through Terry and Diamond Dallas Page, Glenn was able to get his foot in the door at World Championship Wrestling. Glenn had a tryout match with good friend Canyon at center stage, and because the North Georgia audience had seen Glenn work before on the Independents, he actually got a great heel reaction. Disco Inferno was hired on the spot. He went to meet Eric Bischoff a few days later, and the rest is history. Disco Inferno had his first televised match on the August 21st, 1995 WCW Saturday Night tapings, airing on the 23rd of September. There is a Canyon vs Disco match from WCW Saturday Night on YouTube right now, but this is not his tryout match. This match happened a few months later. The Disco Inferno theme music was used right from the get go also, Glenn came out wearing a white outfit inspired by John Travolta, and yeah, it's strange seeing a debuting character get such a good reaction, but as Glenn explained, this was due to him already being known around the Georgia area. WCW Nitro had only began airing on the 4th of September, so the Disco Inferno was right there when it all went down, when wrestling history would begin altering in a huge way. Disco then would become a WCW Nitro original, a cornerstone of the television show, who worked on the fourth ever broadcast of Nitro, and also appeared on the second to last episode. Disco's first Nitro match on September 25th, 1995, saw him take on Daz Wunderkind Alex Wright, and admittedly, there were a few missteps during this match from both men, but it was still very possible. Alex Wright got the win with a backslide, Disco found himself back at the WCW Saturday Night tapings before getting his second Nitro match on the October 30th episode, losing here to Sabu but getting a great crowd response during his match. This match too was quite entertaining just due to how opposite these two guys were. Disco was more concerned with dancing and making sure his hair was on point, while Sabu was busy diving around the ring like a wild animal. Shortly after the Sabu match, Disco made his WCW pay-per-view debut at WCW World War 3, competing in the World War Battle Royal. Soon after his pay-per-view debut, Disco Inferno was moved to Nitro Dark matches while still competing on WCW Saturday Night and WCW Worldwide, getting only one Nitro match over the next couple of months, a uh, loss to Paul Orndorff. If I'm honest, I think this was for the best. In hindsight, watching the late 1995 version of Disco Inferno is definitely not the same as the late 1996 Disco Inferno, and if you look out for the subtle differences, you too will notice the changes in his gimmick and his ring work, as small or big as the changes may have been. Disco Inferno was more than capable of having good matches, but staying away from live TV shows allowed him to get even better in the ring, and I firmly believe that Disco Inferno became a better superstar because he wasn't initially featured on Nitro every single week. The full scale cruiserweight movement had not happened yet, Disco would be working against guys like Ed Leslie, Jim Duggan and Pat Tanaka, and what's worse, he'd be jobbing to these exact same people. Alex Wright became a regular opponent for Disco Inferno also, but Glenn would need more young superstars to work with, guys around his age who he wouldn't be forced to job to on a regular basis. 
Thankfully, Disco would get better opportunities in 1996 to work against guys like Chris Jericho, Chavo and Eddie Guerrero and Conan to name a few, and while he would still lose frequently, he was having better matches with these younger guys. This brings us then to the whole Disco Inferno gimmick, it's something I feel needs addressed. Disco Inferno's gimmick during this era was over the top, a disco dancing fool, someone who wanted to bring disco to the masses, dancing around the ring, fixing his hair, all that stuff. Some people didn't like the character, but I thought Glenn Gilberti done an incredible job with the Disco Inferno gimmick. I thought he was fantastic in the role and I genuinely look forward to seeing him on WCW programming. Glenn became the Disco Inferno. He was fun, he was goofy, but it was entertaining. In the early days he would forget how to apply holes and have to bring notes to the ring with him. Stuff like that I enjoyed because it wasn't supposed to be taken seriously, it was entertaining. If you watch WCW back then, you'll know that a ridiculous amount of time was spent on Hulk Hogan and eventually the New World Order, and it got to the point where commentators would constantly talk about the NWO during matches that the faction weren't even involved in. I'm a huge NWO fan, but that doesn't mean that it's all I ever want to see on WCW shows. Disco Inferno was so far away from what the NWO was doing that he was a welcome change, a nice palate cleanser after watching a 20 minute promo featuring Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff talking about how great they were. Here comes this disco dancing maniac who doesn't take himself too seriously, he's having fun being a goofball and he's entertaining fans. I mentioned this in my WCW Cruiserweights video, but I think people had trouble seeing past the gimmick with Glenn, which led to people never giving him a real chance. They'd hear the theme music, see a glimpse of his entrance and think, oh here comes this disco guy, and I think that is really unfair. He could work, he never stopped being his character, he had people smiling, dancing and laughing in the audience. Trust me, I take a lot of screen caps for these videos, and I couldn't help but notice how fans were genuinely smiling during Disco's entrances, and yes, there is a mix of people laughing along with Disco, and people laughing at Disco, but it doesn't matter, people were still having fun. I don't know, I just think people are way too harsh on Disco Inferno. People expect world champions every 10 minutes and people can be instantly dismissive. I think Disco was excellent in his WCW role and he's one of those characters that always comes to my mind when I think of the WCW mid card. So Disco was splitting his time between WCW Saturday Night, Nitro and Worldwide shows during 1996 as he continued to improve his character and in-ring work. But then in the summer of 1996, Disco would begin getting more time on Nitro. With the Cruiserweight title now established, Disco Inferno went on to Bash at the Beach 1996 to have his first singles match on pay per view against Cruiserweight Champion Dean Malenko. It's true what they say about Dean Malenko, he was a master of his craft and this match here with Disco proves that. The two went out for around 10 minutes and it was a good match, and it's actually also a forgotten match from Bash at the Beach 1996, considering the NWO formed that evening and everything else about this pay per view has seemingly been erased from memory. Disco didn't win the cruiserweight title here, but he did have a good showing, and you'd think that this match here would have helped elevate him up the cards a little, but no, Disco was straight back to Saturday night and worldwide tapings. After losing to Diamond Dallas Page and Glacier on two separate episodes of Nitro towards the end of 96, Disco must have been feeling a bit down. Beginning 1997 with a string of wins on Saturday night and worldwide didn't really help matters. The guy needed exposure and wins on Nitro, WCW's flagship show that was destroying WWF Raw in the Monday night ratings. Glenn was called to the WCW offices to discuss a storyline. Kevin Sullivan and Eric Bischoff wanted Disco Inferno to lose to Jacqueline on TV. Glenn was unable to see how a match between Jacqueline and himself would be competitive, but he took the bait and asked what would the plans be for Disco Inferno after jobbing to Jacqueline. Glenn quickly noticed that there was no plans, Bischoff and Sullivan began throwing out random ideas, and this, to Glenn, was a warning sign. 
They wanted him to job to Jacqueline just for the sake of it, just to see a woman pinning a man in the ring. That's all it was. Glenn also put two and two together here. He had not signed a new deal and he thought that the Jacqueline match could be his final WCW showdown. And losing the Jacqueline, he felt, would hurt his chances when signing with the World Wrestling Federation. He would always have that loss hanging over his head with fans and whatnot. You have to remember, this was before China started having matches. This kind of thing wasn't done on big wrestling shows at the time. Disco left the meeting and he talked to Diamond Dallas Page and Terry Taylor, among other people, and everyone told him not to do it. It would be too damaging. Disco then went back to Eric and said that he would not job to Jacqueline, and Eric fired him on the spot. Remember, if a certain other WCW star approached Eric and said, well, that doesn't work for me, brother, then Eric would have bent over, both forwards and backwards, to come to a solution that works. Eric told Disco that he was free to find work elsewhere right away, but Glenn soon got word from WCW lawyers saying he had a no-compete clause he had to adhere to for four months. Disco was able to work non-televised shows for smaller promotions, but he could not begin working for the WWF, even though Jim Cornette and Bruce Pritchard had been phoning Disco to get status updates. Disco Inferno Silhouette was even put in the WWF magazine as a tease, implying he would be arriving as the Honky Tonk Man's new protege. But those who watched my New Age Outlaws video recently would know that Rockabilly ended up becoming the protege. So what happened with Disco Inferno in the WWF and why didn't it happen? Vince Russo later told Glenn that during one of his phone calls with Bruce Pritchard, Glenn may have said the wrong thing or just didn't say the right things, something just didn't click, but had Disco pursued the WWF a little longer, he probably would have got hired. This could also be Russo blowing smoke or trying to make the WWF look bad, we'll never know. Disco bumped into Sting at a gym. Sting asked why Disco wasn't around WCW anymore. Disco explained the situation and Sting went to Eric Bischoff and got Disco his job back. The first thing Eric Bischoff said to Glenn upon walking back into WCW was, we need to figure out a way for you to put over Jacqueline. Disco had no other choice. Booker and friend Terry Taylor though had a plan. Terry decided to put the TV title on Disco Inferno. There's no way Eric Bischoff would book a champion to lose to Jacqueline, right? After losing to Hugh Morris in his return match on the 8th of August 1997 and again losing to Dean Malenko on the 15th of September, Disco defeated Alex Wright on the 22nd of September 1997 edition of Nitro to win the TV title. And I'll say this too, the match with Alex Wright here I thought was good. Disco was then featured on Nitro way more than what he ever had been, with title defences against the likes of Juventud Guerrera, Diamond Dallas Page, Alex Wright and Rey Mysterio. This whole thing also highlights how much of a mess WCW was. Nobody was on the same page. The bookers were trying to work the executive producer. It's just a real example of how WCW operated back here. But anyway, Eric sort of put Disco's mind at ease when he said the story should be about how Disco wouldn't put his hands on a woman. But Jacqueline was so fierce and aggressive that Disco had no other choice. And he would work the match with this story of him being apprehensive about about wrestling a woman. Jacqueline vs Disco Inferno ended up happening at Halloween Havoc 1997. The match kinda worked to be fair, but still to this day people point to this match as a low point in Disco's career. Still, he done what he had to do, he negotiated a new deal, and he was back in the fold. He also got a championship title reign out of the whole ordeal, so not bad. Disco Inferno then went on to feud with Perry Saturn, giving Disco the opportunity to have more good matches here with a well-rounded wrestler on TV. Disco dropped the TV title to Saturn on the November 3rd 1997 episode of Nitro, and after this, the pair had a solid match at World War 3 97. Disco regained the TV title from Saturn on the 8th of December 1997 episode of Nitro, before again dropping the title just three weeks later to Booker T. 
Take away the title changes here and what should stand out is that Disco Inferno was now being used as a regular on WCW Nitro, something that should have happened after the Dean Malenko match at Bash at the Beach 1996. In between these title matches, Disco Inferno also had matches with Scott Hall, Randy Savage and Kurt Hennig on Nitro and while he wasn't picking up big wins here, it was still miles better than where he was a year prior. 1998 saw Disco Inferno get more TV time thanks to the introduction of WCW Thunder at the beginning of the year and man, Disco worked a lot in 1998. While no championship opportunities came Disco's way, there were months where Disco was featured on TV 6 or 7 times, which is quite incredible when you think about all the talent that WCW had during this time period. Yes, Disco Inferno was not main eventing, but he was sure getting his name out there at every opportunity he had, and through all of it, his gimmick never wavered. He wasn't complaining to the office like everyone else in WCW, the guy went out there and done what he had to do. Disco began teaming with Alex Wright in 1998 for the first time, a tag team that was more amusing than successful to be fair, but it still added something different to the usual NWO stuff that WCW fans came to expect. Alex Wright and Disco Inferno mainly feuded with the public enemy and at Fall Brawl 1998, the duo, known as the Dancing Fools, were able to work against WWF veterans the British Bulldog and Jim Nadhart, though Disco Inferno said it wasn't a great experience. Let's skip forward to another part of Disco's WCW run, the part that Disco Inferno says himself was the best of his career. Disco Inferno would become associated with the NWO Wolfpack after he, along with Bam Bam Bigelow and Scott Hall, helped Kevin Nash defeat Goldberg at Starcade 1998, ending Goldberg's undefeated streak in WCW in the process. Disco had been trying to prove to the Wolfpack that he was worthy of becoming a member, and after Starcade, Kevin Nash said his victory will always have a dark cloud hanging over it, boy he wasn't wrong there, because Disco Inferno helped him. So Big Sexy said that if Disco wants to prove himself and earn his stripes, he can go out and have a singles match, all he has to do is win. What Disco didn't know though was that Bam Bam Bigelow was his scheduled opponent. Disco put up a good fight but Bam Bam was just too much and Disco didn't earn his Wolfpack stripes on this night. The following week, the finger poke of doom went down and from this, the NWO Elite was born. It seemed like Disco had given up the NWO dream when he showed up on the next episode of Thunder without the Wolfpack red and black. On the January 11th 1999 episode of Nitro however, Disco Inferno passed Scott Hall at Taser during Scott's match with Bam Bam Bigelow, helping an NWO member here as it seemed Disco still wanted to gain acceptance into the Wolfpack. Surely this act would be enough to get Disco into the faction, and it seemed like he maybe did become a member, coming out in a traditional Wolfpack shirt and some custom red and black pants the next week. Scott Hall came out and assisted Disco during his match with Wrath, and the two celebrated together going back up the ramp, and it did seem like Disco was now truly a member of the Wolfpack. As it would turn out, he was more of a Scott Hall lackey, never a true bona fide Wolfpack member, but more of an NWO wannabe that Hall would exploit. Prime example, the red and black NWO were shown getting off their private jet the next week on Nitro, everyone was there but Disco Inferno. Later in the evening, he came out with Scott Hall, helping him carry a ladder before Hall's match with Bam Bam Bigelow. So what was happening here? Why was Disco getting this sudden run with the NWO? Well, you have to remember that the booking team was beginning to drastically shift around this time, the creative team was going through changes and someone obviously saw something in Disco that others didn't. Either that or someone just really liked the guy personally and wanted to help him out. The safe money says it was Kevin Nash or Scott Hall, two guys who had a great deal of stroke when it came to creative and booking in WCW. Anyway, Disco would continue working against the likes of Booker T, Buff Bagwell and Conan while still wearing the Wolfpack colours. Some today consider him a member, others don't. 
Me, yes I say he was a member of the NWO, simply because he wrestled more matches wearing NWO colours than NWO members did themselves. He wasn't a Wolfpack member at the height of their popularity, but he was still technically a member of the faction. Do I think it was a good creative move? No, I don't. I thought Disco was unique enough, he didn't need to be like everyone else. And this is where I'm going to stop things, as the remainder of Disco's time in WCW is kind of like WCW itself during this era, quite unremarkable, even with numerous changes. When the NWO angle finally fizzled out, Disco went on to capture the Cruiserweight title. He was soon renamed as the Hip Hop Inferno during his brief time in the Filthy Animals faction, and then he was renamed Disco, D-I-S-Q-O, as in the same spelling as Cisco. Remember that guy? Disco would also reform his tag team with Alex Wright, now known as the Boogie Knights, and the tag team were scheduled to win the tag titles at the German exclusive Millennium Final pay-per-view, but Disco ended up getting injured and the match finish was changed. This was the last real remarkable thing to talk about here. Disco formed a brief alliance with Mike Sanders in WCW before the company was bought out by the WWF. Disco had been added to the creative team also during the final months of WCW and he decided not to pursue a WWF career or inquire about a job because he was tired and wanted a break from wrestling. There's stories out there about his booking methods and his booking philosophy but this video has already gone on a little too long. And that was the Disco Inferno in WCW, an entertaining character and a fun gimmick that I thoroughly enjoyed, as much as other people tend to rip on the guy, simply for having a gimmick that maybe didn't appeal to them. If wrestling's supposed to be fun, if we aren't supposed to take this stuff so seriously, if it's meant to be entertaining, then I don't care what anyone says, Disco Inferno done his job incredibly well in my eyes, and I had a lot of fun going back watching these Disco Inferno matches and getting a kick out of his entrances and promos. I hope you enjoyed this video, but more so, I hope you take the time to go back and watch some Disco Inferno matches. Those who are unfamiliar with his work should actually give the guy a chance. Thanks very much for watching. Yeah.